The Death Worlders A Story by User Hambone Chapter 20 Exorcisms Part 3 Date Point Four Years, Nine Months, and Three Weeks After Vancouver Um Ora U Uatun Planet Aru Elder Space Allison Bueller Awesome Blurs, noise, a warm hand on her cheek. Ah! Julian. Allison! Now, how did speech go again? Oh, yes. Ah! Uh... Oh, shit, you're awake. You had me scared there. It hurts. Hey, look at me, okay? Allison forced herself to focus on his eyes. He shone a light into her face and stared intently at them for a second, checking the dilation of her pupils, before finally nodding. Okay. You're okay, I hope. It happened. She tried to move, then collapsed as nausea washed over her. You tell me. I got here. You and the guys are all unconscious. Kirk and Zane are missing and Vedrig. He indicated a breathing mountain of dark fur that was crumpled at the foot of the hospital stairs with shoots of dark red moving up and down it. I think Zane was just planning to knock him out as well, but I think he's really hurt. I can't get him to say anything. Allison squinted at him. While she knew every word in what he had just said made sense, and so did the arrangements too, for some reason she just couldn't quite... It clicked. Shit! Vedrick! She stood again, squelching the nausea this time. Whoa, hey, maybe you shouldn't... Maybe I should, she grunted, teetering on her feet as she staggered towards Vedrig. The hell did he hit me with? Looks like a steel ball of some kind? Julian held it up. Oh, the... ha. Huh. The ha. Huh. What? Forget it. How... how are the guys? Alive, but barely responding. You've all got serious concussions. I don't know. Nothing we can... The word she was looking for was a fuzz that just wouldn't resolve. So she aborted the sentence and concentrated on remaining upright just long enough for her legs to gratefully give out and dump her by their governorag comrade's head. Vedrig? It was hard to tell, but she thought he moved slightly. Vedrig? I... guess you don't handle pain like we do. I need to know if you're conscious. Just do anything, okay? One of Vedrig's huge, bloodshot blue eyes rolled open from behind three layers of nictitating eyelids and looked right at her for just long enough to confirm he was still among the land of the living, then screwed shut again in agony. Allison knew how he felt. Come on, I can't stop the pain if I don't know where you're hurt, she said, grateful to have something to focus on. It was helping her work through the concussion. Chest! The big alien coughed, eventually moving his hand where it was cradling his flank. There was an obvious dent there. Shit! No wonder you're like this! She was carrying two medical kits. The smaller one, the green bag on her belt, was made by and for humans. Any one of the painkillers and treatments it contained might kill Vedrig outright. The other, a metal box about the size of her forearm, was intended for use on aliens and came with the major advantage of being pseudo-intelligent, capable of diagnosing, prescribing, and prognosing injuries and ailments in all known interstellar species. Humans, sadly, weren't in its database yet, and probably never would be. Allison knew from past experience that most E.T. drugs simply didn't work on Death Worlders. Governor Ag patient, fractured ribs... She informed it, and held the device's black end, a low-powered, short-range medical scanner, over the break. She held her breath as it took the measure of the damage and exhaled happily when it reported that the injury, while undoubtedly agonizing, was not life-threatening, and ordered her to apply its injection end to three spots around the wound. It hissed alarmingly as she did so, but Vedrig seemed to appreciate whatever it did, as he relaxed and made a noise very like, Ah! Painkillers? A local anesthetic. And a regenerative, most likely, Vedrig replied, returned to his usual communicative self. Thank you, Allison. I fear had he punched me much harder than... 
I would no longer be with you. You rest. Look after Amir and Lewis, she told him. We've got... Oh! She had stood up and had to steady herself on Julian. Allison, you need bed rest, he told her. Fuck that! We've got to get back to the ship. Of course. Shoo, Julian said. Right. He's obsessed. I knew it. He saw his chance and took it. You should be flattered, Vedrig commented. He rendered you unconscious first. And I doubt he'd have done it at all if Julian's foot hadn't broken, Allison retorted. Come on, let's get after him. She was damned if she was going to let a few spinny buildings in the way her own limbs felt blurry stop her from getting payback. Date point. Four years, nine months, and three weeks after Vancouver. Scotch Creek Extraterrestrial Research Facility. British Columbia, Canada. Earth. Captain Owen Powell. I. First, we were... Powell exhaled and started over. We spent a month on Cimbrian getting set up. Just me and the lads getting things ready for the civilian colonists. Day they arrived, I remember she. The girl fucking rampaged down the ramp the second it was down. She was racing her brother to be the first civilian colonist to set foot on a new world. She won. Right proud of it, too. You have a soft spot for children, don't you? Ford asked. Never met a soldier who doesn't, Powell retorted. Peggy seemed to have finally fallen asleep on his lap. You were at Camp Bastion, right? That's right. Well, you've got to remember the kids around the camp, right? The locals. They become mascots, don't they? I always remember how jaded some of them were, though. They got it. Aye. It? Powell grimaced and scratched the back of his head. It's... This is going to be a bit hard to explain. Don't worry about explaining it to me. I think I know what you mean, but for your own sake, just think out loud. I think the other two teenagers around Falkther get it as well. Adam and Ava. S- the girls. Her friends. They'd come from San Diego. They were out of town when the bomb went off. I was fucking everything. The homes, friends, schools, family. And they got it. They understood what s- she didn't. Which is? Powell exhaled. Okay. Right, so... He thought for a second. People say, life is unfair, right? Yes? Bullshit. Complete fucking rot. Totally backwards. Life is fair. Terribly, terribly fucking fair. Life doesn't give a shit if you're a 40-year-old soldier or a 14-year-old schoolgirl. It'll kill you like that. He snapped his fingers for emphasis. And not even give a shit. The stars keep burning, the worlds keep turning, but that's it. That was your fucking lot. It's fair because it treats everybody exactly the same that way. Ford remained silent and kept eye contact, letting him say more. I get that. Powell continued. Adam and Ava get that. The kids in Afghanistan and Iraq got that. This girl... He paused, then frowned at himself and gathered the strength to say her name. Sarah didn't. And you're angry at her for that. No, not... Peggy made a protesting noise as Powell set her aside and stood up to pace the room, hunting for the right way to start a sentence. She was the... I mean, you'd... Describe her. That stopped him. What? What? Who was she? What did she look like? How did she behave? Powell looked back at the couch and smiled faintly when the dog gave him an uncertain tail wag. I don't... No, wait. I've got it. You ever go round a council estate, Major? Occasionally. They've always got those same kids on them, don't they? Like there's a fucking machine somewhere stamping out exact copies. The scrawny skinhead boy who thinks he's hard. The pretty girls who'll be pushing prams and chain smoking before they can drive. You know the ones. I should know what that kind of kid is like. I used to be one. I think I follow you. Imagine the complete opposite, Powell said. Somebody who'd never in their life wind up mooching around by the co-op, trying to talk strangers into buying them fags and vodka. Somebody different. Better. And Sarah was such a person. 
All three of them. Her and the two others. There, she was alive. Living in the moment. Real people. They know who they are. Which I sure as fuck didn't at that age. And who was Sarah? Peggy licked his hand as Powell picked her up and sat down again. Like something out of a bloody Enid Blyton book, he said. You know, the plucky children investigating fucking mysteries, thwarting gangs of gunrunners and what have you. I've never read them, Ford confessed. Not worth it, mate. Naive fucking horseshit, every word of the fucking things. You said that you're angry at her, though. Why? That's just it. I don't fucking know, Powell seethed. I wasn't mad at that kid in Kenya, or at those Yazidi girls in the Persian Gulf. So why should I be angry with Sarah? She's the fucking victim here. Well, turn the question around. If you can't figure out why you are angry with Sarah, perhaps it will help to think about why you were not angry with the others. That seemed reasonable. Well, you know about what happened, right? In those other two cases. Ford nodded that he did. I've read the notes, but it's probably best if you recount them in your own words. Powell sighed. Keratina Market, Kenya. There was a little boy, like five or six. His parents had given him... He laughed a little at the memory. <laughs> I remember it was this really cheap fucking knockoff plastic Ben 10 backpack. And the fucking thing was full of C4 and ball bearings. He patted the dog's side. She had her chin on his lap and was looking up, listening. His mum and dad were sitting in the car with one of those old Nokias. We saved the kid that time, and a lot of other people too, but he didn't see that. All he saw was the nasty white men who'd come and killed his daddy. Never fucking mind that we'd shot the evil bastard to stop him from calling the bomb and blowing up his own little boy. We were the bad guys. You don't blame him for that, though? Course I don't. He was a little and didn't fucking understand what was happening. Never crossed the poor little bugger's mind that his parents might murder him like that. It got to me, but, you know, that's dealt with. I can deal with being the bad guy if he's alive and doing something with his life. Who knows? Maybe after all these years he's figured out what happened and forgiven me. And the Persian Gulf? Different story. That one were afraid to involved in slave trafficking. They got a handful of Yazidi girls in a shipping container. Going to some buyer in Thailand. There was a cock up at the Thai end. The buyer spooked and the freighter chucked the container overboard. Worthless cargo now. All the drone operator could do was fucking watch. You were angry, then? Ford asked. Fucking raging. Powell nodded. His expression darkened. We boarded the ship, had all those bastards sat in a circle, and they were jawing and joking and asking for cigarettes. They thought we were Americans and all acting like they didn't know what had been in that container. Like they hadn't heard the banging and screaming from inside. Like they weren't slave-trading fucking scum who just murdered five little girls. I wanted to bundle every man of them into a crate and tip them over the side myself. But that wasn't the hard part. He paused. No. The hard part was that the container burst. Pressure difference, right? So all the bodies came back up. We had to fish them out, skinny little blue-eyed girls, and there were tiger sharks following the ship. They eat whatever falls overboard. His fists clenched. I, I was angry there, but at the right people, you know. Only reason we didn't shoot those cunts in the kneecaps and throw them to the sharks was pure bloody professionalism, and I still think it'd have been no less than they fucking deserved. What do you think the difference is between those cases and this one? Powell thought about it for some time, petting Peggy as he did. I think... I think I'm angry at her because she got herself into it, he said at last. Like, this brave, beautiful, stupid fucking girl had to go in and help when the cavalry was already on the way. Like, if she'd just been smart about it, she... I... He swallowed, then started to shake. I never looked a child in the eyes while she was dying before. He croaked. She said her last words to me. She was scared. She, when I closed her eyes, her, 
she'd been crying. So, so she was so afraid, and the tears made my glove wet. He stared at his hand. I couldn't bear to take it off for hours. He sat staring at his fingers for a few moments until the dog, very gently, inserted her nose under his palm and hauled herself into his lap, wagging sympathetically. He laughed a little, grabbed her and hugged, sobbing into the fur. Ford let him get it out of his system. Finally, the captain made a weak, woo-ug noise and sat up, wiping his face dry. Fucking, I never cry, he said. You needed to, Ford observed. You know, I think you're right, Powell agreed. I've just not done that since I were a kid. Sorry. He wiped his face again. Don't be. In fact, I'd have been worried if you hadn't, Ford reassured him. Are you really angry at her, do you think? Now that you've had time to think out loud? No, I don't think so. Not really. Not anymore. She's like that poor boy in Kenya, isn't she? She didn't know any better. It never crossed her mind that maybe her parents had led her wrong. Her parents? Aye, these dippy, hippy, tree-hugging, free-love, pagan parents of hers. Her dad's got these tattoos, and it harm none, do as thou wilt. He gestured along his forearm to show where the two halves of the phrase were inked onto Mark Tisdale's skin. Sexually open, no boundaries, no rules, no fucking sense of consequence. I'll just bet you they never once told her that no, there's things that you can't do. You know, like they'll have told her you can do anything, trying to empower her in that, and it got her killed. How do you feel towards them, then? Ford inquired. You've compared Sarah to the child in Kenya, but what about the parents? It's, it's, it's not the same. Powell mused. The bastards in Kenya, they had the phone in their hand. May as well have dug the little guy a trench and put a gun to the back of his head. They were going to murder him just as dead either way. But the Tisdales loved their daughter. So fucking much. They'd have never deliberately hurt her. But they coddled her so much that she never learned one of the most useful survival skills in the world. Which is? Knowing when it's time to stop fucking playing. He sighed. Was saving them is that they didn't know they were doing it. They're as fucking ignorant as their daughter was. Do you think you can forgive them for that? Powell inhaled and exhaled deeply through his nose but didn't answer, beyond shaking his head and stroking the dog. Ford nodded. Why not? I can forgive a child for not knowing how the world works. Powell replied, after a moment's thought. It's bloody cruel, but there it is. She didn't have time. And the first chance she got to learn, it killed her. She could have been smarter. Should have been. But, you know, she was just fourteen. A girl. Part of the cruelty of it is that we want them to be innocent at that age, don't we? We don't want to spoil their fun. But adults should know better. Ford finished the thought for him. Fucking right. Powell sniffed and shook his head. I'm not sadistic. I'm not going to rake him over the coals for it. They're suffering enough, but... He shook his head again, breathing out. But I don't think I'll ever be able to look at either of them without thinking, you know. You're the reason I had to watch your daughter die. What are you going to do? Powell finally made eye contact. And there was a hardness in his gaze now that had been absent throughout the interview. One that looked quite natural and comfortable there. I'm going to find something important of the hierarchies. And when we're done with it, I'll use the largest piece that's still intact for a fucking paperweight. Major Ford smiled appreciatively. I think this session has been good for you, he opined. Powell nodded. Aye, I think it has, he agreed. I feel sharp again, more myself. I would still suggest you come back for at least a couple more sessions, Ford added. After that, it's up to you, but at least two more seems prudent. Aye, at least two more, Powell agreed, and stood, putting Peggy down, but pausing to scratch at her ears one last time. 
Don't want to undo all our progress, do we? He asked the dog. Indeed not, Ford agreed. We're available any time, Captain. You let me know if we're needed. I will. Powell shook the Major's hands. Thank you, sir. Good luck. Don't fucking need it, mate. Date point. Four years, nine months, and three weeks after Vancouver. Um ora u uatun. Planet Aru. Elder Space. Kirk. This isn't going to work, you know. Hushya! I've read your file. Narcissistic personality disorder. A terrible thing. You were receiving a lot of therapy back on Earth to help you cope. Weren't you, Zane? Aseash! Kirk wriggled a little as Zane's grip tightened around his upper arm, feeling the bone creak alarmingly in the Deathworlder's grip. Not had any since you left Earth, of course, he continued. But you could do. We can still take you back. You can still get the treatment you need. If you keep behaving this way, though, that may not happen. Zane broke his arm. Kirk fought down the rattling creak, which was the Urt Herk equivalent of a scream, while Zane just cursed and shifted his grip to the lower, sturdier arm. Blood clot! Why ya it broke so easy? Kirk turned his pain into a slightly hysterical laugh. Evolution! he replied. Different worlds, different... He creaked in pain again. Bones! Hush ya! Yeah. Even if you do get us to the ship and we take off, Shu isn't fragile like me. Or she be. Daughter to care, you know. The eyes me leverage. She too soft, let the eye come arm. They were nearly at the ships. As they entered the area lit by their industrial lights, alien workers turned to watch the sight of a human driving a Rurk three times his height towards them. You're not well. You're not thinking straight, Kirk protested. We're offering to take you back to... Ah! To Earth! Other women, you don't need this one. You're acting out. This is a crisis. hush You'd better let go of him, Zane. Allison stepped out from among the packing crates, aiming her sidearm at him. She was clearly in a bad way, squinting against the glare of the floodlights and swaying a little bit. And her aim was not up to its usual rock-steady standard. Zane twisted around, dragging Kirk into the line of fire. Yakyan shoot sin, lest your one hit your boy. True. Julian? Ah, ah, Zane chided, raising his hand to wrap around the base of Kirk's throat. I know you creature you tump a foot man I try that. I make a move and me break your boy here, sight. And then what? Kirk rasped around his hand as Julian stepped into Zane's sight line and hefted his hatchet warily. You kill me and you'll lose your advantage. Your plan leaves something to be desired, Zane. Dare I still be dead? I admit, the prospect doesn't thrill me. But you're threatening to make the situation worse for yourself, not better. Hoshya! Kirk waved an arm, beckoning Julian and Allison to fall back. Over the dermal patch microphone in his throat, he explained his reasoning, sub-vocalizing so low that even Zane couldn't hear him, and the translator certainly couldn't. He's histrionic. He was so convinced of his superiority that now we've punctured it, he's liable to panic. What do we... What do we do? Allison replied, murmuring so that Zane couldn't hear. If we give him the chance to calm down a bit, we can build him back up. Get him to calm down. Get him to think that what we want is his idea. And if we can't? Julian asked him. He seems pretty close to a breaking point, boss. If it comes to violence, it comes to violence, Kirk said. Great! I'll try to leave him alive. They were passing through the middle of the field of equipment and crates surrounding the Cortai research craft, when the Cortai in question decided to interfere. You appreciate, of course, that there is a third option, the male, Lesri, observed. He and Kanadna were in Zane's way, and they ignored Kirk's attempts to signal for them to move. Get away, Zane ordered. Rather than resort to violence, Lesri said, stepping forward, you could sign on with us. 
a bit of muscle would be useful, and we have the means to deliver you back to Earth without your being a prisoner in the ship you arrived on. What say you? I want, Zane growled. Shoo! And ask yourself if that scenario seems likely right now. Hmm? Less repushed. Be realistic. He stepped forward again. I'm offering you the chance to part ways peacefully as a free man. That seems like the most rational... Zane backhanded him. It was a casual, almost gentle motion, but it highlighted the huge disparity between human strength and Cortai mass by flipping Lesri head over heels over a crate with a sickening noise like a baseball being thrown at a sack full of cockroaches. It was all the distraction Kirk needed. He twisted, turned, darted sideways, and his prosthetic arm lashed out, extending its concealed fusion blade. Kirk went one way. Zane reeled the other. Zane's left forearm left a crater in the sand where it landed between them, smoking, glowing, and bloodless at the cut end. Rudnick had a decent turn of speed over very short distances, but Kirk knew humans well by now. Zane's scream may have been of agony, but there was a very large component of adrenaline and rage in there as well, and no short-term turn of speed was any good at all when a pursuit predator was angry at him. The only recourse open to him was to turn at bay and get ready with his sword, prepare to strike a lethal blow if he could, but that much mass traveling that fast would probably end very badly for him even if he did. Facing the murderous fury in Zane's eyes was worse. Julian and Allison had retreated on his orders and were now sprinting to catch up, but they were too far away, on the back foot. Zane was going to beat them. Xiu got to him first. If Zane's casual backhand had hinted at the disparity between Deathworlder muscles and Cortai bones, then what Xiu unleashed on the enraged Jamaican was an object lesson in just how physically far ahead of the rest of the galaxy humans truly were. Zane had time enough only to register her presence as she rose up in his path before she delivered four blows, any one of which would have exploded through Kirk's body like heavy pulse gun fire. The first exploited his missing arm, driving into his chest, knocking him off balance and driving the wind out of him. The second was laser-targeted on his jaw, stunning him. As he staggered, the third blow was delivered to his left eye and the fourth to his right. Her precision flurry of violence took less than a second. Zane's headlong berserk charge turned into him staggering, dropping to his knees in the sand, wheezing, and falling over when he tried to support himself on a hand that was lying several meters away. He wasn't out, though. Running on adrenaline and anger, he still tried to haul himself to his feet, swinging wildly with his remaining arm even as his eyes swelled up and blinded him. Shu just stepped and flowed. And wherever the flailing limb went, there she wasn't. She was angry too, Kirk decided. Furious. But it was a different kind of fury. Zane in a rage was a bellowing beast, roaring and thrashing around like a wounded vulza. Shu, on the other hand, became a machine. Her face locked down, her eyes locked on. Everything about her unified into a cold and methodical instrument of violence that simply took the most efficient path to avoid harm, and then, when the opportunity presented itself, she stepped forward and delivered a straight punch to Zane's skull, just behind the ear. The delicately balanced tug-of-war that kept bipedal humans upright and moving ceased instantly, and Zane crashed into the dirt, unmoving. In the stunned moment of stillness that followed, Xiu made hardly any noise simply allowing her breath to hiss out from between her teeth, and then she straightened, inhaled through her nose as she touched her fist to her palm in a boiguan, then exhaled as she let her entire body relax. Only the hardness in her eyes remained, though even that thawed a little when she glanced at Kirk. "'Are you okay?' she asked. "'He broke my arm, but I am alive, thanks to you,' Kirk said." and meant it. I am impressed. Understatement central there, boss, Allison chimed in. Holy shit, girl! You cut his arm off, Shu observed. She didn't sound happy about it. Necessary, I'm afraid, Kirk replied. Yeah, but... Oh, God! 
A distinct green color rose in Shu's face, and she turned away, breathing heavily. Allison rubbed her back, making soothing noises. Allison, can you tend to his injury? Allison looked up at him, then reluctantly nodded. Sure. Julian? The pair of them hoisted the unconscious Zane onto their shoulder and dragged him, and Allison herself, Kirk suspected, in the direction of Sanctuary and her med bay. That left Kirk and Shu alone. The Cortai team were tending to their wounded shipmaster, who seemed to be alive, thankfully. Are you all right? He asked. Just, just... Shu slowed her breathing. I'm okay. Oh God, they left his arm. She turned away again and bent over, trying not to vomit. Are you sure? Kirk asked her, as soon as she seemed to have recovered a little. She laughed a bit. I never thought it'd be like this, she complained and wiped at some tears that were threatening to form. Monsters and fighting and cutting off people's arms. She sniffed, and after a few more cleansing breaths, she stood up and raised her head, staring at a night sky and stars that only six specimens of the entire human race had ever laid eyes on. I want to go home. And what do we do with Zane? Does he get to go home as well? Shu blinked at him. You're the shipmaster, aren't you? she asked. I am. And I say as shipmaster that it's your decision. To hell with my arm. You're clearly the one he really hurt. Whatever it was that happened between you. Then he... Shu began firmly but paused. I... She sighed. Let me give him one last chance. By all means. Now, if you don't mind, I'm in rather a lot of pain, and we need to send Julian back for the others. Date point. Four years, nine months, and three weeks after Vancouver. Starship Sanctuary. Planet Aru. Elder Space. Zane. Zane had been knocked out in bar fights in his time, but returning to consciousness this time wasn't like those other occasions had been. It was just like... waking up. What? You were drugged and treated. You're actually in pretty good shape, Zane. It was Shu's voice sounding oddly tinny, and that suddenly made Zane aware of his surroundings. He was curled up on the floor of one of Sanctuary's airlocks, big enough for a governorag to use. It was a large room by human standards. Shu's face was at one of the windows, so pretty, so cold. That same look that had made him angry at her. Didn't she know who she was dealing with? The stump where his arm ended just below the elbow felt cold and beyond that was a strange numbness. That should have bothered him more, but his ego ratcheted into gear, redirecting all the grief and insecurity that somebody without his personality disorder would have felt into pure, grim anger. There would be a reckoning. You gonna let me out? he asked. One way or the other, Shu replied, speaking through a microphone. Look behind you. Zane blinked and did so. There were stars beyond the opposite window. It took him a second or two to make the connection between that fact, his being in an airlock, and what she had said. Please. Who did she think she was bluffing? You wouldn't, he declared. Me no eyes you. You don't do that kind of badness. To be rid of you? She declared. What happens when we get back to Earth, huh? You come after me again? You hurt more people? You hurt me again? He laughed. Go on then. Bluff called. He congratulated himself. There'd be a showdown with Kirk. He'd have vengeance for his arm. And the others would fall in line. They'd see what kind of a man he was. The howl of the alarm and the sound of the doors whining into gear when Shu pressed the button drove all of his confidence out of him in a rush of cool air threatening to escape. Shu, no! You can't do this! He rushed the door she was behind, knocking and shouting, Shu, no! I'm sorry! I hurt you. That was wrong of me. Me leave you alone. Just let me go back to Earth. The alarms didn't stop, and her hand on the release didn't fidget. You want to go home too, huh? She asked him. Those eyes were so cold. He'd hurt her. He'd hurt her, and now she was going to murder him. He couldn't believe that she would. He couldn't believe that the others would let her. But there were hungry stars waiting for him. Yes! He screamed. 
Please, Shoo, I'm begging you, please. She paused. Her eye contact drifted away. Her hand moved away from the final release. She softened, and the relief trembled down him. He meant every word. She'd be left alone if only she... Walk home, asshole! She hit the button. The overpressure in the lock flung him shrieking out of the ship and into the river Uatun, a mere four meters below. Date point. Four years, nine months, and three weeks after Vancouver. Folk the colony, Cimbrian. The far reaches. Legsy Jones. All right. Legsy Jones took a minute or so to check he was in absolutely pristine military trim before knocking. He knew the captain had actually gone to counseling, but after the last meeting with Powell, he was damned if he was going to be on anything but his most perfect behavior. Come in. Moment of truth. He poked his head into the captain's office. Powell looked rested. The darkness around his eyes was gone, he'd tidied up the drifts of paperwork into a more organized system, and his camp bed was made. The captain himself was standing at the wash basin, rinsing shaving foam off his face. Latest from intelligence, sir, Legsy said. Cheers. On the desk, please. So far, so good. But he wasn't about to relax just yet. The dossier joined some of its fellows on Powell's desk. Do you need anything, sir? No, thanks. I'm good. Carry on. Sir! He was halfway through turning and leaving when Powell suddenly threw his towel onto the bed. Sergeant. Sir! Legsy turned around. The captain blinked at him, expression unreadable, then crossed the room and stood in front of him. He wasn't a large man, Legsy realized. He just seemed that way. I, uh... Powell began, then fell silent. His clock ticked out six seconds before he shook his head. Ah, never fucking mind, Legs. Keep up the good work, mate. Yes, sir. Inside his head, Legsy wanted to punch the air and grin. Powell snorted. Well, go on. Carry on, then, he said. Instead, Legsy grabbed him in a bear hug. Eh, what are you fucking? Let go! Powell protested, and Legsy did so. Powell straightened his jumper and frowned at him. The fuck was that about? He demanded. Sorry, sir. Legsy straightened to attention. It's just good to have you back. Powell hung his head and shook it, smiling. Get out, you big fucking softy, he ordered, kindly. Yes, sir. Once Legsy had gone, Powell retrieved the towel and hung it neatly to dry, checked the room for any other signs of things out of place, and allowed himself a satisfied nod. It's good to be back, he agreed. Date point. Four years, nine months, and three weeks after Vancouver. Um Ora'u Uatun, Planet Aru, Elder Space, Kanadna. Kanadna squinted at the figure staggering towards them out of the dark. It had been only a few minutes since the sanctuary had taken off, vanishing over the horizon with all the power that its gargantuan power core could produce, and she had watched the evicted psychotic Deathworlder struggle ashore with some interest, not to mention satisfaction. You have to admit, they are extremely tough, she observed. An amputation, a concussion, and a four-meter fall into the water only seemed to have annoyed the dark-skinned human, really. He was, if anything, probably as dangerous now as he had been a few hours ago. More so, possibly. Are we taking him with us, ma'am? I think not, Kanadna replied, not even bothering to show her contempt for the moronic inquiry. Get the last of the equipment stowed. I want the ship locked up and ready before that human gets here. The Kuambura crewman rushed to obey. Kanadna herself enjoyed the leisurely stroll back to the ship, arriving just in time to turn in the airlock, check everybody and everything was on board, and then activate the ship's primary shields right in the approaching Deathworlder's face. This move did not seem to please Zane, who sprinted the remaining distance in an eye blink and Kanadna had to clamp down hard on an instinctive reflex to flinch, cower, or run. Let me in, he demanded, his tone of voice promising all of the impressive capacity for violence that his species was capable of unleashing, should she fail to comply. Now, 
Why would I do that? Kanadna asked him. You rather badly injured somebody I quite like. You seem to have an alarming inclination to use vi- Zane interrupted her and proved her point by slapping the force field, which rang and flashed alarmingly. But Kanadna kept calm. Not even a human can punch through starship-grade weapons shielding, you barbarian idiot, she told him, keeping a tired inflection in her tone. Let me in, he roared. Kanadna mentally sent a few commands over the ship's control circuit, telling the pilot to begin the launch sequence. Frankly, the only thing stopping me from using one of this ship's plasma guns to vaporize you where you stand is because I think leaving you all alone here with a dying species seems more... poetic, she said. I can be useful, he said, changing tack. You want a nice strong human on your ship, I can do the heavy lifting, fight off the pirates. You already rejected that offer, Kanadna pointed out, but she made a show of mulling the suggestion over. Besides, you would be a lot more useful if you still had both arms. She let him rant for a few seconds, ignoring the content, and interrupted him after a careful internal countdown. I tell you what, she offered. You can come aboard if you help me expand the limits of Korti scientific knowledge. What? Well, I have this hypothesis that what happens to a death worlder when he's standing directly beneath the primary kinetic engine of a starship at takeoff... She made a meaningful upward glance. The engine in question was beginning to whine, barely audible to Korti hearing, but presumably quite clear to a human's more acute senses, is much the same thing as what happens to everything else in the galaxy. Zane stared upwards, swallowing and breathing heavily. There was an alarming blue glow beginning to manifest somewhere inside the device. If you're not willing to test my idea, Kanadna told him, then you can always run away. You have... Oh, eight seconds? He looked back down at her, plainly afraid now. I'd start running, she said sweetly. Once they were airborne, she dusted off her hands, shrugged out of and hung up her sand robes, and visited the ship's medical bay. Lesri was sitting up, expression taut as he endured the procedure of having regenerative medicines injected directly into the extensive damage at his shoulder by the surgical robot. I saw how you got rid of him he said, waving his undamaged hand at a floating projector monitor. Nicely done. I took the liberty, she agreed. I assume you don't disapprove? Oh, no, he said. If he was too ignorant to know that absolutely nothing happens to a being standing beneath a kinetic thruster when the ship takes off, then he would have been of no real use anyway. Besides, he added, grimacing as a fresh needle delivered a shot of cruiser deep into his flesh, I believe your own words were something like, Never underestimate a human? Absolutely never, she replied. Predictable, though his attempt to take over the ship and chase after them would have been, it would also have been alarmingly plausible that he might succeed. Best to leave him behind. Lessery agreed. The surgical robot finished its work, leaving his arm bound up and immobilized, but the pain had clearly faded. You continue to impress me with your competence, Kanadna, he said, easing himself down off the medical bed. I think we work well together, she replied, internally glowing at the compliment. I think we do, he agreed. Shall we continue our association? Make it more formal? Indeed, Lesri said. A DNA exchange, perhaps? I'm agreeable to that. They widened their pupils at each other, a rare Korti expression of genuine warmth and affection, not dissimilar to a human's shy smile, and Kanadna congratulated herself. Today had been a good day. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this one here today. Thank you so much for watching. I am so glad to have you all back and uh, reading slash listening to The Death Worlders. We're back at it. MIA was fun, but we are right where we need to be right now. Some great stuff is happening, and it's going to be super great. If a woodchuck could chuck wood, would a woodchuck chuck wood?